So um, today I'll tell you a little bit about our, <clears throat> our work in um, trying to understand how microbial metabolites impact behaviors in animal models consistent with autism. And this, I think, um, uh, dovetails nicely off of both Leticia's uh, 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 talk as well as aspects from June and a couple of the other speakers as well. So just a little bit of background on our focus on the gut microbiome. Uh, just for everyone's um, information, that the gut microbiome consists of, of largely bacteria, but viruses, protozoa, fungi, and microorganisms that total about 100 trillion cells. And what that uh, equates to are the number of microbial cells in our bodies actually exceed those of our human cells, which I think is quite astounding. But even more impressive is the contribution of these organisms to our biology. And, and one metric of that is the fact that our microbiome or the collective genomes of our gut bacteria contain about 100 to 150 times as many gene families as our, as our own genome. And some have speculated our microbiome to be our second genome that networks with our, our human genome to mediate processes of, of health and disease. And also quite interestingly is the, the microbiome has a metabolic capacity of the human liver and roughly the same weight as the adult brain. And largely in animal models, um, though of course more work is being done on the microbiome in humans, we now know that gut bacteria impact a variety of neurological conditions. We're speaking obviously about autism today, but the impact of gut bacteria have been extended to classical anxiety, depression, and even uh, neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Uh, regarding metabolic disorders, uh, obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease have been associated with the microbiome, again, emerging um, human work, but a, a lot of this is based on, on animal models. And of course, immunologic responses. When we think about bacteria, we often think about uh, how the immune system uh, interacts with bacteria. Here, um, in the context of the microbiome versus classical infectious disease, there's growing evidence that microbiome helps tune or um, educate uh, immune responses that then may impact inflammatory bowel disease or autoimmune uh, 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 disorders, as well as gastrointestinal infections. And Leticia already spoke to us about the various different conduits uh, by which the gut and the brain can communicate. And so I, I won't. Um, uh, uh, repeat this, but suffice to say that the context of, of my current talk today is the role of microbial metabolites, how specific microbes are produced by bacteria can get into the circulation, at least in one experimental case, actually arrive in the brain and impact uh, cellular molecular functions and behaviors in mice. We started this work many years ago in collaboration with Paul Patterson at Caltech, uh, using the MIA model. And June introduced this model to us where infection during pregnancy leads to uh, offspring that uh, display many of the core features of autism that are highlighted um, here, but also interesting neuropathologies as well that have been identified in subsets of, of the autistic brain. And um, this model, again, as June mentioned, has um, significant epidemiologic support uh, consistent with large uh, uh, population studies that show that infection coupled with fever during pregnancy leads to uh, uh, an increase in autism diagnosis in humans. And so uh, many years ago, we used this model to initially try and understand, is there a role for the gut potentially and potentially the microbiome? in behavioral and GI symptoms associated with autism. As we've already discussed, um, there is a significant proportion of individuals with autism that have gastrointestinal symptoms that range from constipation to diarrhea, bloating, and abdominal cramps. And there's emerging evidence um, uh, that, but more work needs to be done, emerging evidence that there is actually a, a specific uh, 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 in barrier integrity defect in individuals with autism. This is often uh, called leaky gut, but um, uh, some researchers have noticed that there's increased permeability uh, 
in the intestines of individuals with autism. And again, several years ago, when, when we were doing this work with Paul, we identified uh, this leaky gut phenotype in the, the MIA mouse model. And that's shown through this, Fitz, essentially through this Fitzidextran experiment where we give a fluorescent dye orally to animals and that dye is coupled to a large polymer, a large sugar molecule in this particular case, and um, which doesn't uh, easily get across the, the intestinal epithelium. And then we measure fluorescence in the bloodstream. So an increase of fluorescence in the bloodstream is a marker for increased leakiness because again, the fluorescent dye is coupled to a large molecule that would largely get across the epithelium if there was damage to the intestinal lining. And we see in the offspring of the poly IC mice that there's increased uh, fluorescence in the circulation uh, relative to the control saline animals. And in this set of studies, um, we used a, a human organism called Bacteroides fragilis, which uh, we had previously identified um, to restore GI function uh, in mouse models of Crohn's disease. Here we show that this same organism appears to be therapeutic in terms of the GI symptoms associated with autism in this particular mouse model, because this leaky gut phenotype appears to be um, restored upon treatment with Bacteroides fragilis. Um, and the cellular uh, base of that um, is, uh, we believe to be uh, based on the fact that tight junction proteins are altered in the MIA model and then improved by Bacteroides fragilis. And so tight junction proteins are molecules that hold the intestinal epithelium together. The intestinal epithelium is a single layer of cells that separates the internal body from contents in the gastrointestinal tract. And when these tight junction proteins are altered in their expression, you can imagine sort of like in a, in a zipper-like fashion that the epithelium may open up and molecules that um, aren't meant to get across the epithelium may actually um, bleed into the, the circulation and ultimately reach uh, various different organs. And we showed through uh, RNA studies, but potentially, um, or perhaps easier to see with these protein studies, that particular tight junction proteins, in this case, clodinate, is decreased in poly IC mice relative to saline animals and an increase of bacteria fragilis, and clodin 15 is increased in the poly IC animals and then again restored a bacteria's fragilis treatment. Again, this is treatment into the offspring, not into the, into the, the, the mothers. And so what this suggests, and, and there's previous literature showing that clodinate uh, decrease in clodin 15 increase leads to increased intestinal permeability. And again, that appears to be the basis of this leaky gut. And so it was gratifying to show that this, this uh, bacterial uh, therapy uh, improves GI function, um, but we were also quite pleased to see that it improved uh, behavioral symptoms in these same animals. So here we're looking at ultrasonic vocalization. This is how animals, um, uh, uh, rodents communicate with each other and we can detect um, this communication through this ultrasonic uh, microphone. And what we can measure are a number of features of communication between animals, <clears throat> excuse me, but here we're uh, graphing the number of calls that the animals em emit, as well as the duration of each call. And you can see that animals that are offspring of poly IC injected mothers um, call less. So if you compare them to the control animals, the number of calls are reduced and then the duration of their calls are reduced as well. So we uh, interpret this to mean that there's a vocalization defect in these animals. And when we test uh, the group of poly IC offspring that were um, orally given Bacteroides fragilis, you can see that both the number of calls as well as the duration of calls were improved back to what are control or quote unquote healthy levels. Same with uh, repetitive behavior, which is a, a, a or same with the marble bearing test, which is a measure of repetitive behavior and uh, uh, also of anxiety. And we can see that animals um, that are offspring of poly IC injected mice uh, bury more marbles in a given amount of time relative to these control animals. And again, this repetitive stereotype behavior is improved with Bacteroides fragilis, which as I've already mentioned, improves the intestinal barrier. And so we started to wonder how the, the gut and the brain were linked in this mouse model. And of course, there's likely multiple mechanisms um, by which the, the two organs communicate with each other. 
Um, but one of the, the analyses that we did was to look at small molecules um, in the periphery, in the circulation, and ask, is there a dysregulation of microbial metabolites between the three groups of mice, the control groups of poly IC mice, which exhibit autism-like behaviors, and the mice that were treated with bacteria fragilis. And so we did an untargeted metabolomics analysis, um, looked at a number of different small molecules uh, that were altered between the various different groups, but focused on one, um, again, this was um, identified back in 2013, called 4-ethylphenyl sulfate. This is a small molecule that's produced from tyrosine through a, a set of enzymatic reactions that are carried out only by gut bacteria. So we or mice or other animals don't appear to have the enzymes required to convert tyrosine into 4-ethylphenyl. And then 4-ethylphenyl is then sulfated um, in the liver to 4-ethylphenyl sulfate. So the ulti ultimately the molecule that we see in circulation and potentially the, the bioactive molecule is 4-ethylphenyl sulfate. And so again, you can see this um, graph here, just focusing on this one molecule, um, uh, not the, all the other molecules that were dysregulated, but an almost a 40%, over a 40% increase in 4-ethylphenyl sulfate in the poly IC offspring compared to saline controls, which are then reduced by bacteria's fragilis treatment. And so uh, we wanted to uh, understand, is this same uh, dysregulation of microbial metabolites, in particular 4-ethylphenyl sulfate, found in a human cohort? So Leticia told us about the paracresol data, which had been published a number of times to be elevated in the urine of individuals with, with autism. And so we wanted to capture um, additional molecules which had not yet been reported and 4 ethyl sulfate had not yet been um, uh, analyzed in, in a human cohort. And so um, we performed an untargeted metabolomics analysis of 129 plasma samples um, from autistic individuals and 100 typically developing uh, uh, samples. We looked at both feces and plasma. I'm just going to really show just the 4th ethyl sulfate data, but again, there were many other metabolic changes in um, these samples. And so what this study showed um, was that there is a subset of individuals with autism that have really high levels of 4 ethylphenyl sulfate compared to typically developing individuals. And what's also quite interesting in this work that we did with Paul Ashwood at UC Davis and Alyssa Cassano at MGH is that individuals that have gastrointestinal symptoms have an elevated level of 4 ethyl sulfate compared to typically developing uh, kids. You can see that there's almost a ninefold or over ninefold increase in um, samples that were uh, taken from ASD individuals with GI symptoms as opposed uh, or, or relative to typically developing. And even those without GI symptoms had an elevation, an almost six fold elevation as well. And so again, this starts to suggest that maybe these GI symptoms are related to the metabolic um, changes and potentially these, these metabolic changes uh, in particular small molecules may actually impact behavior. And it's that hypothesis that led us to uh, this current study. Again, everything I'm showing you beyond the initial MIA data is still yet unpublished. And so uh, in a, a recent study, we want to understand specifically, does 4-ethylphenyl sulfate really have any um, uh, 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 behavioral effects in mice? You know, the human data suggests that maybe 4-ethylphenyl sulfate and other molecules can serve as biomarkers but it also uh, doesn't, you know, because it's correlative um, uh, cross-sectional data, it doesn't suggest that it's involved in, in the, the disorder itself. It may just be, you know, irrelevant or an epiphenomenon that isn't a driver of behavior. And so again, we can use mouse models to test the function of specific molecules like for ethylphenyl sulfate. And again, I wanna just reiterate that, that this is one molecule of many that appear to be dysregulated in autism, um, but of course, you know, the, the scientific uh, rigor required to identify function of these molecules takes time. And so we're sort of, sort of moving our way through these various different molecules. And so uh, working with uh, Michael Fishbach at Stanford, uh, we were able to uh, first identify the genes in bacteria uh, 
that are required for the conversion of tyrosine to parachromatic acid to 4 vinyl phenol and ultimately to 4 ethanol and then um, incorporate or clone these genes into bacteria that are genetically manipulable so that now we can produce two groups of bacteria. The bacteria are identical in terms of what species we're using, but they either have the genes to produce 4-ethylphenol or they are missing those genes. And so it's a very, and then we take these, these bacteria and then we colonize germ-free mice and then we look at the effects of this metabolite. So of course, again, it's a very reductionist system. It's a very simplified uh, system, certainly not natural, but it gives us very clean um, uh, uh, answers to what this particular uh, molecule may be doing. And so, as I mentioned, uh, the bacteria produce 4-ethylphenol. So when we look in the feces of the two groups of mice, we can detect 4-ethylphenol only in the group um, uh, of animals that were colonized with bacteria that contained the genes for the production of 4-ethylphenol. When we look in the urine or the plasma, the urine data is shown here, we can see an elevation of 4-ethylphenol sulfate, specifically in the, the group of, uh, of mice that have the bacteria that harbor the genes. And then ultimately, when we look in the brains of these mice, we're able to see an elevation of 4-ethylphenol sulfate, um, again, in the group uh, where the bacteria in the gut produced 4-ethylphenol. So this suggests, it doesn't prove, but it suggests that potentially the, this metabolite uh, may reach the brain and actually affect cellular and molecular physiologies that impact behavior. So we want to understand just on a, on a macroscopic level, are there differences in brain activity between the two groups of mice? And so these, this is an activity-based analysis um, and specifically it's the uptake of, of radioactive glucose, which marks those brain regions that are more active in the 4-ethylphenol positive group versus the 4 ethanol negative group. And so in red are regions that are more active, in blue are regions that are less active. And you can see that there are a number of different regions that have been linked to emotional behaviors in mice that appear to be increased in their activity in uh, animals that were exposed to 4 ethylphenol in their intestines, and then certain areas that appear to be less active. And so not to overinterpret this data, there are you know, areas like the, the PVT that we'll come back to in a minute, again, have been linked to, to behavior and there seems to be a, a change in, in activity, but also this notion that there's a decrease in activity in other brain regions lends itself to hypotheses that were proposed or have been proposed in autism that there are differences in, in excitability and inhibition of different circuits and brain regions, and also differences in connectivity where certain regions may not be communicating with others in the autistic brain uh, in a way that's uh, similar to that of the neurotypical brain. So again, um, this is suggestive of, of, that, um, of those connectivity data. But in this uh, project, of course, we're quite interested in how the various different brain regions are communicating with each other. But for this project, we wanted to really dig deep into what is the cellular molecular basis for, the, for these changes and the effects of 4-ethanol sulfate. And so we um, uh, performed a, an RNA-seq experiment, a gene expression profiling experiment with Dan Geshwind, who uh, we just heard from. Uh, and looked at six different brain regions um, and identified the paraventricular nucleus of the, of the thalamus or the PVT as being the most highly dysregulated in terms of uh, gene expression differences. And then when we did cell um, enrichment analysis, there appears to be um, an effect on neurons, which, are, which um, is expected. Um, but we also found, uh, curiously, this effect on oligodendrocytes. And so these are um, acronyms for oligodendrocytes. Oligodendro and I'll explain the, the biology of oligodendrocytes in a minute. But oligodendrocytes are cells that, can, that mature, um, and you can identify different versions of oligodendrocytes. So there are um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, which are um, immature cells. Um, and there are mature oligodendrocytes, um, where, which are marked here. And we looked at the various genes that, that um, uh, uh, have a profile for uh, uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And we can see in the green that the genes that, that highlight oligodendrocyte precursor cells are elevated in the 4EP positive group. And the genes that mark uh, mature oligodendrocytes appear to be almost uniformly decreased 
in the 4EP positive group. So this suggests that there may be an arrest in oligodendrocytes, or at least an, a change in oligodendrocyte maturation uh, mediated by 4EPS. And, and um, uh, oligodendrocytes, as I mentioned, are, are, are these cells that can mature from, from precursors to mature oligodendrocytes. And once they mature, they myelinate neurons. And myelination uh, is a process that helps uh, uh, neurons and their axons conduct electrical impulses. Think of this similar to the coding on a copper wire that helps that, that, that copper wire um, uh, conduct electric current. So we want to understand, is there truly an effect on oligodendrocytes that the gene expression data uh, suggested? And so using uh, markers to um, uh, highlight and uh, characterize mature versus uh, immature oligodendrocytes, we see that there's a decrease in the, matura in the maturity quotient uh, of oligodendrocytes in the brains of mice that were exposed to 4-EP in the gut compared to those animals uh, that have bacteria that don't produce 4-EP. And that's based on this uh, imaging um, for um, CC1 and NG2. And, and, but interestingly, there's no difference in total oligodendrocytes. So it's not as if this subset of cells are missing. It just appears as if they're not maturing. And so that's, um, uh, this was done by immunofluorescence. We also uh, um, supported this with flow cytometry data, which again shows that there's a decrease in um, uh, mature oligodendrocytes in the brains of animals that were exposed to 4-EP in their gut. And as I mentioned, uh, oligodendrocytes uh, have uh, multiple functions, but primarily are cells that myelinate neurons. And so uh, it, a decrease in, in mature oligodendrocytes suggests there's a, a, an effect on myelination. And we directly measured this through electron microscopy studies um, that we did, that we performed with Mark Rudinsky and Pamela Bjorkman at Caltech. And again, we can see that, in fact, there is an effect on myelination um, uh, relative to this microbial metabolite, where the number of unmyelinated axons are increased in the 4-EP positive group. And the G ratio allows us to look at myelination um, regardless of, of cell shape, because these cells can take on multiple different shapes. So it's, it's hard to actually um, measure the thickness of myelin directly, but the G quotient allows us to do that. And a higher G quotient means that there's less myelination. And we see that here in the 40 peak positive group. But we can also look at the, the thickness of these myelin tracts and the, their thickness has decreased. All of this consistent with uh, a reduction in myelination in the brains of animals exposed to 4-EP. And ultimately, we want to understand how does this impact um, uh, 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 behavior. And so we looked at anxiety-like behaviors in the open field test, where we place an animal into an arena and measure how long uh, the mouse spends in the center of the arena. The less time the mouse spend, spends in the center, the more anxious that animal is um, because animals feel safer closer to the walls. And you can see that there is a, a, this anxiety-like phenotype in the animals that were exposed to 4-EP. We can uh, support this with elevated plus maze analysis where um, this, this apparatus has a, an open arm and a closed arm and mice um, tend to feel safer in the closed arms but do venture out into the open arms to look for food and mates and, and, mates and other, and other um, interesting things. And you can see that these animals spend more time, um, uh, or sp sorry, spend less time in the open arms of the elevated plus maze. But in addition to the anxiety test, there appears to be an effect on, and on autism-like behaviors as well. So we can look at social interaction, and this appears to be different. So total social interaction is decreased in the 4-EP positive group, and there seems to be a shift or a change in how these animals interact through uh, measuring anal general sniffing. And then when we looked at ultrasonic vocalization, the number of calls and duration of calls are decreased in the 4-EP positive group, again, suggesting that these animals are vocalizing less. And so the studies um, that I showed regarding bacteria spagillus suggest that probiotic treatments can improve uh, both GI and behavioral symptoms by repairing the gut. And so if there's this leakiness and these metabolites get across the gut, if you improve gut function, then less of these harmful metabolites may actually traverse the gut and get into the circulation. But there's also other strategies um, that for potential therapeutics that come from this work. So if these metabolites truly have a negative uh, impact on behavior, then perhaps one can use a small molecule drug 
to target the metabolites directly. And that's what we did here. So, um, and this is in collaboration with, with Axial Therapeutics, where we used an oral non-absorbable sequestrant um, and we treated the animals uh, with this drug. The drug is not, again, not absorbed into the circulation, but it has an affinity for the for chlorothal sulfate and these types of molecules. And the idea is that the drug will soak up or bind these molecules as it's um, uh, passing through the gastrointestinal tract. And then the animal, in this case, excretes um, uh, the drug with the microbial metabolites, effectively lowering the concentrations in the circulation, which we verified, and potentially in the brain. Um, but then the ultimate effects on behavior are that the drug can improve uh, uh, behaviors in the open field, can improve behaviors in the uh, elevated plus maze, and can improve behaviors in the marble burying test. And so it's a it's a quite a safe drug. Um, so we're quite a, we're very excited about the potential of taking this basic science learnings and uh, potentially developing drugs uh, based on how microbial molecules in the gut may be affecting brain function. And so ultimately, just to summarize. Uh, the study is that there are changes in the autistic metabolome, not just the microbiome, but the molecules that these um, uh, organisms produce. Those metabolites get across the barrier, potentially uh, more so in individuals with leaky gut. The, in, our, in this particular case, the molecule uh, for ethyphenyl is sulfated uh, to for ethyphenyl sulfate, which then uh, again increases in circulation and ultimately gets into the brains of mice uh, arrest solid adenosine maturation and then leads to behavioral changes via uh, altered uh, myelination patterns. And so I'll stop there and, and just very quickly thank the people who did the work. Uh, almost all the work that I showed you, the unpublished work that I showed you today uh, was done by Brittany Needham, who's a postdoc in our laboratory with help from Mark and Wei Li. Um, here are our, our list of, of collabor uh, collaborators. Everything we do is highly collaborative and we really appreciate all the, the tremendous support and expertise of our collaborators. And here are our funding sources, um, uh, including the Brain Foundation. So I will stop there and stop sharing my screen. And a couple of questions. Given that I only have you... two minutes, well, maybe I'll, I'll be able to find a, a quick question. Yes, Pramila? There are a couple of questions in your chat and there's one on the Zoom chat. So I'll read, uh, back in 2012, uh, Dr. Paul Patterson at Caltech had done work using bone marrow transplant to show that behaviorally abnormal MI offspring uh, that have been irradiated and transplanted with immunologically normal bone marrow no longer exhibit deficits, stereotype, repetitive behaviors, anxiety-like behaviors. Was there any follow-up to this work uh, done? If not, was it due to the perceived risk? And so um, that work that, that we did with Paul initially, um, where we looked at the role of immunity and in this particular case, bone marrow transplants, did show that there was a role for the immune system. The work hasn't been followed up um, for uh, the likely reason that bone marrow transplants are, are quite invasive and um, uh, really require uh, you know, careful thinking before one would take this approach in, in the clinic. But I think that, that that research was fundamental in helping to establish a role for the microbiome in uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, at least this animal model, and more importantly, a role for the immune system in this animal model. Um, and others, we've again heard from June already, uh, and others are now following up on the role of immunity um, and of, of course the microbiome and how that could be impacting behaviors associated with autism.